Many of you who know me well know that I love to watch movies. In fact, my wife regularly makes fun of me because I have a list of my top 25 movies that I update pretty regularly. I am that into it. In fact, we have our students over on occasion and we watch movies and kind of talk about some gospel correlations to them. Well, many of those movies on my list are war movies because I love a good epic battle scene. And one of those movies is the movie Gladiator. Now, if you've seen the movie Gladiator, you know that it opens up with a very epic battle scene. You've got the German barbarians that are kind of coming out of the woods and getting ready to engage in this battle. And that is kind of opposed to the, the view that you see from the Roman army where they are gathered there and ready for battle. And they're about to engage. And I remember watching this for my first time as I think I was in high school at the time. I was over at my cousin's house in Texas. And this is my first exposure with a surround sound home theater system. And it was set up really well. It was a big flat screen TV. And it was my first time kind of like being really immersed in a movie. And the way it was set up, there was, if you have seen the movie, you know that there's one shot that kind of views the, the battle from the Roman army's perspective. And they sent out these huge fireballs into the, the woods and, and these hordes of arrows that are uh, lit by flame. And you see it from the Roman army's perspective and all these arrows going out. And the way the surround sound was set up, it made it, made it feel like the arrows like whipping right past your ear. It was one of the coolest experiences I've ever had. Well, when thinking about that, um, you, as much as I love a good battle scene, and some of you may love good battle scenes, maybe that's not your thing, that's not Summer's thing, really. Um, as much as I love that battle scene and, and many others, there's an even more important battle that each of us fight every single day of our lives in our pursuit of godliness. And that is what we see here in Galatians 5, the second half of Galatians 5. And as we read through this, I'm going to read verses 16 through 26 for us this morning. And we're going to do things a little bit different. Um, one thing I'm going to ask you to do is, I don't, if you're able and willing, I want to ask you to stand in honor of God's word as we read this text together. And as we read this together, um, this is actually my fourth time preaching this specific text of Scripture. And I noticed as I was studying for it that there is a theme of four that has kind of come out a few different ways as I've looked at this text. And so one thing I want you to do is, as we read through here, I want you to try to identify four different ways that Paul talks about how we interact with the Holy Spirit. The way we interact with the Spirit, he, he notes four different ways in which we do that. And so try to identify those. So that's one way that we see the group of four. We also see that the, the works of the flesh are grouped into four different categories. We'll talk about that a little bit when we get to that point. Um, but also, as I preach this fourth time through the text of Galatians, um, Summer and I are expecting our fourth child, if you didn't know. So the Hecox house is expanding. Number four is on the way. But the main thing I wanted you to take away from the group, the, the identification of the different four is the way that Paul talks about how we interact with the Spirit in four different ways. And just a, a, a hint, the first one is really early on, at the very beginning of this. So follow along with me. Verse 16, I'm going to start reading. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit... You are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Go ahead and take a seat. Thank you for standing in honor of the reading of God's word. 
You know, when you think about the, the battle scene from Gladiator, in one sense, you could say this battle was all about freedom. You got this Germanic tribe that was fr- fighting for its freedom from Roman rule and influence in the way that they went and lived their life. Whereas the Roman army was fighting for the freedom of uncontested rulership of the known world. They wanted to fully dominate the entire wor- known world at that time and have no external threat that was a, uh, a serious or a major threat. They wanted the freedom to be able to have full domination of the entire world. And so we see these two forces battling for freedom. And freedom is actually what Paul has been talking about all along as well. If you back up to Galatians 5, uh, beginning of Galatians 5, he says at the beginning there, for freedom, Christ has set us free. So Paul opens up that way and says that they should not return again to a yoke of slavery. This freedom in Christ, it both frees them from the need for circumcision. Now, Paul has been connecting circumcision to the law. Law is the bigger thing, but circumcision is the main example that he's using. It frees them from that, from the need for the law to obtain salvation. But it also frees them from that and frees them to do the works of Christ. So this freedom is double-folded. folded. It's, it's freedom from this, but freedom to do what Christ has called us to do. And these are all rooted in love. And this was the whole point of Pastor Allen's message last week when he talked about living in freedom um, as we looked at the first half of Galatians 5. Well, in verses 13 through 15, Paul begins to draw a contrast between what freedom in Christ looks like and what the slavery of sin looks like. So he draws this contrast. He starts that in verse 13 through 15 that kind of carries on in the text that we just read. So this kind of brings us to our passage this morning where we see that that Paul correlates freedom with living in Christ. So freedom equals living in the Spirit. And then he correlates slavery to the law with our flesh. So he's he's drawing these two different correlations as he talks about that. So freedom equals living in the Spirit. This is one picture we see. This other picture we see is of the slavery to the law that equals our flesh. Tim Keller labeled the main idea of this passage by saying, We grow as we battle. We grow as we battle. And so in this text, we see that our spirit is battling against our flesh. The spirit that God has given us is battling against our flesh. And through this process, through this battle, we grow in our life in Christ. We grow in our liberty through Christ. And we grow in our love for Christ. The three points that this sermon series has all been about as we've worked through Galatians. Life, liberty, and love. We see that we grow in those three things through this passage. So this brings us to our very first point. I'm going to argue as we looked through um, and maybe you identify those four different ways that Paul talks about and the ways that we interact with the Spirit. I'm going to argue that the main point he's making is that we are living in the Spirit and there's three different other ways that we interact with the Spirit to help us to live according to the Spirit. And so... With the message being all about living in the Spirit, we see the first one, that we live in the Spirit by walking by the Spirit. We live in the Spirit by walking by the Spirit. So, question, how do we live in the Spirit with our lives? Verse 16 tells us to, but I say, walk by the Spirit. And here, Paul uses a present active imperative verb. It's a mouthful, I know. But the Greek word there is peripateo, and it's a present active imperative verb verb with the word walk. And it indicates that it's a command for us to actively do. This is something that we are supposed to actively be working towards, actively doing within our lives, walking by the Spirit. Anyone who has been walking with the Lord for any extended amount of time knows that it takes effort. It takes work. We do not grow on our walk with God without practicing what are oftentimes called the spiritual disciplines. And when you think of spiritual disciplines, you probably think of like uh, prayer, Bible reading, meditation, memorization, uh, fellowship. Those are some common things that we think of when we think of the spiritual disciplines. Well, uh, there's actually a lot of different spiritual disciplines, over 20 of them uh, that have been identified by different authors. One of those authors, a guy named Richard Foster, in his book, The Celebration of Discipline, he helps categorize those for us in three different ways. Inward disciplines, outward disciplines, and corporate disciplines. Let's look at those briefly. 
So inward disciplines, uh, that includes things such as like Bible intake, uh, prayer, and meditation. And they help form our character and our inward way of life into the image of Christ. They help form the, the inner self into the image of who Christ is. Um, at the end of the service, we're going to be challenging you in a very specific way to practice the discipline of prayer as we intercede for those within our lives that, that God has brought into our lives, the lost world around us, and, and go to the throne room and ask him to intercede in their lives to bring them to the point of salvation. We're going to ask you to do that in a very specific way. That's what those cards are there for you. So if you want to be looking at those cards and be thinking through that, we're going to ask you to write down five different names of people that you're going to be intentionally praying for, sharing the gospel with, and inviting them to come and see who Jesus is. One of those ways that you can invite people to come and see who Jesus is is by our next big event that we got coming up, Heaven's Gates, Hell's Flames. And we're going to ask you to be interceding on their behalf that God would intervene in their lives and to the point of salvation. So that's one example of inward disciplines, forming our inner self into the image of Christ. The other one is outward disciplines. And those are things such as service, evangelism, and simplicity that are more focused on how you interact with those around you, specifically the lost world around you. So how we interact with the place that God has put us into. The third category that he identifies is that of corporate disciplines. And these are things such as worship, confession, repentance, stewardship, that typically take place within the communal body of Christ. As we're interacting with our brothers and sisters in Christ, these are disciplines that are important for our pursuit of godliness. It makes me think of 1 Timothy 4.10, where while Paul is instructing his younger disciple, Timothy, he says, to this end, we toil and strive. Now, to this end is referring to godliness. If you look at the context of 1 Timothy 4, it's very clear that Paul is talking about this end being godliness. And if we're going to obtain godliness, it comes through toil. It comes through strife. It comes through hard work, the hard work of a disciplined lifestyle. All three of these categories of spiritual disciplines are vital to be trained for godliness. And all three of these categories require hard work through toil and strife. You know, thinking of the the battle scene at the opening of the movie Gladiator, there was one obvious difference between these two armies. One, the Roman Empire, the Roman army, was highly disciplined, whereas the Germanic tribe was not disciplined at all. If you look at the pictures of how they both approached the battle scene, the, the Germanic tribe kind of comes out of the, the woods to the edge of the woods, and they are making a huge ruckus. They are like beating on their shields. They are uh, incredibly fierce. You can't deny their, their ferocity as they uh, approach the battle scene. They're even like throwing heads out into the middle of the battlefield. They are intense, but they are not organized. They are not disciplined. They are coming at it from an individualistic mindset. In that culture, they wore it as a badge of honor for the number of Romans that they could kill. And so, man, they were going at it with an individualistic mindset of, man, I'm going to take out as many Romans as I possibly can. And that was their approach to battle. But the picture we get from the Roman Empire, the Roman army, was much different. They were one cohesive, unified unit, working as one for the purpose of victory on the battlefield. They were moving and operating together. It was was a kind of thing of masterpiece to see played out on the screen as they all worked together as one. You get these thousands of of, uh, soldiers that are working together collectively as one unit, following the instruction of their commander. Now, the reason they were able to do this was because of training and discipline. They lived a very strict, disciplined lifestyle and went through hours and hours of disciplined, regiment, regimented work to be able to work together and follow the command of their leader at that time. And the fact that the Roman soldiers went through this strict training and disciplined themselves for battle, it gave them a huge advantage of their opponents. This is the reason that the Roman Empire, the Roman army, was so effective in battle because they were disciplined. They worked together as one unified unit. So if they had this approach to battle that helped them experience victory 
and the opponents that they faced, the same is true in our battle for godliness. We are to discipline ourselves with the purpose of godliness so that we can experience victory in this battle against the flesh. So Paul is saying here, walk by the Spirit. We must actively walk by the Spirit through the hard work of a disciplined lifestyle. So he tells us that, verse 16, the very get-go. But then in verse 18, jump down to verse 18, Paul uses a very similar phrase in regards to the Spirit when he says, but if you are led by the Spirit, but if you are led by the Spirit. So verse 16, but I say walk by the Spirit. Verse 18, but if you were led by the Spirit. So that brings us to kind of to our second point. We live in the Spirit by being led by the Spirit. This is one way, this is the second way, that we live in the Spirit. And here, Paul uses a present passive indicative verb, the word ago in Greek, with the words are led, indicating that this is something that happens to us as we passively allow it to. This carries a much different idea than that of an active command for us to do. So verse 16, active command, walk by the Spirit of your own volition. Verse 18, be led by the Spirit. Passively allow the Spirit to lead you. So you may be wondering, all right, what is it? What, which one is, is more important? Which one are we supposed to do? Well, I think Paul is reminding us here of a much-needed balance in our lives. Anytime we get too focused on our own efforts to live righteously before God, we are on dangerous ground. You know, we live in a culture, in a society of the American culture that, that teaches us to, to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. The army has kind of phrased, the, phrased it this way, to be all that you can be. And yes, there's a lot of value in that, but when we think about our godliness, if we are trying to attain righteousness by our own efforts, that is very dangerous ground. That's what uh, Paul has been talking about all throughout Galatians as we studied this book. So that is dangerous ground. But on the other hand, likewise... Anytime we become too focused on expecting the finished work of Christ to sanctify us regardless of our laziness, we're also on equally dangerous ground. So it's a both and here of we can't pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps and obtain righteousness before God, but we also can't sit uh, and expect Christ to, to work in our lives regardless of our laziness. There is no such thing as couch potato Christianity where we sit around and fully indulge in the works of the flesh and expect us to miraculously become more like Jesus in that process. Both of these are equally dangerous ideas that, taken to their extreme, do not promote godliness within us. We see that the end goal of every believer is conformity into the image of Christ. It makes me think of 2 Corinthians 3.18 where, where Paul instructs the church at Corinth there. He says, as we behold the glory of the Lord, we are being transformed into the same image. This is a paraphrase of what he's saying there in 2 Corinthians 3.18. So as we behold God's glory, we are being transformed into that same image. This transformation, this ability to live according to the Spirit, comes from both actively working on things, such as the spiritual disciplines, as well as remembering that ultimately it is not dependent on, upon how much time we spend doing these things, but it's a miraculous work of the Spirit in our lives as we do these things. I found this quote from a seminary out on the West Coast that I found to be really helpful in kind of understanding this concept. Once I wrap my mind around this concept, it, it made a lot of sense. Let me uh, read it, and then I'll kind of work through what it's talking about. It says this, Spiritual disciplines are the tools and pathways to godliness. So spiritual disciplines are the, the roadway that brings us to the point of godliness. They help us to get there. And these practices are good. I, I would argue they're vital. You can't obtain godliness apart from them. These practices are good, vital, but they do not necessarily result in godliness. It is possible for me to practice the spiritual disciplines and not become any more godly in the process. Think of Bible, Bible reading, Bible knowledge. Um, that is one thing we often associate with the spiritual disciplines. Well, we know that Satan himself knows Scripture really well. 
and it has not resulted in him becoming more like Christ. And so it's possible for us to practice these spiritual disciplines and not become any more like Jesus in the process. So yeah, while these practices are vital, while they're good, they don't necessarily result in godliness. It is only the Spirit working in our lives that can bring about genuine godliness. And our invitation is to consent to the journey, to consent to allowing the Spirit to conform us into the image of Christ. And we do that through the spiritual disciplines. I think the illustration of of stretching is helpful here to, to help make sense of what Paul is talking about here. Now, when you think about stretching, you got people like me that are on one end of the spectrum. I am very inflexible. Like, when I try to, like, this is about as far as I can get to my feet. It's kind of embarrassing whenever I try to do a group stretch with other people when I'm playing sports or something. I'm always the butt of jokes because I am wound super tight and very inflexible. So you got me on one end of the spectrum, but then you think of somebody like a gymnast on the other end of the spectrum. A gymnast is typically known as being really, really flexible. And when you think of a gymnast, you think of somebody who can like put their leg like up behind their head. They're that flexible. Now, I promise if I were to try to do that, somebody would be calling 911 because I would end up hurting myself. I am not anywhere near flexible enough to be able to do that. Now, what is the difference between the gymnast and his flexibility and somebody like me? Well, you could argue that um, uh, genetics and stuff has a little bit to do with it, but mostly it is through, he has gone through the discipline training of stretching over time and allowing his muscles to be manipulated and contorted in ways that I have not done. I have not gone through the discipline training to allow my body to consent to the journey of allowing it to be manipulated and contorted in different ways the way that a gymnast does. Just a few weeks ago, Pastor Allen shared a, a video illustration of a guy named Kevin. We're not going to watch it this morning, but a guy named Kevin, a gymnast that helped his Olympic team um, win, I believe, their first medal at the Olympics. And uh, he was um, doing this routine on a bench-looking thing. You'll have to excuse me. Uh, I am not up on my uh, gymnast what, what's it called? Hobble horse? Hobble. Yeah, that. Okay. <laughs> but two handles on here, and he was like flipping his body around, contorting his body in ways that to me are unimaginable. I would never be able to do any of those possible things. But the reason he was able to do that, the reason he was able to manipulate his body and contort his body in such a way was because he had gone through the disciplined training to allow his body to be moved in such a way. His body was able to consent to the journey because he had trained himself and disciplined himself in such a way. Backing up to uh, to verse 17, we see this battle that we are engaged in very clearly when Paul says, for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. The spirit and the flesh are opposed to each other and they keep you from doing the things you want to do. You know, here, Paul is laying out a a pretty generic picture of this battle between the flesh and the spirit that applies to any and every follower of Jesus. But in Romans 7, when he writes to the church at Rome, he gives them a, a more intimate picture, a more personalized picture of this same battle playing out in his own life. Let's look at that together. Romans, Romans chapter 7, I think it's really interesting to see a more personal example of this playing out. Romans chapter 7, I'm going to start in verse 15. If you've read Romans 7 before, you know it's kind of confusing, um, the way that Paul talks here, but I'll I'll explain a little bit as I go. But the main idea I want you to see is that this is a personalized example of exactly what he's talking about at the end of Galatians 5, this battle between the spirit and the flesh that is playing itself out in his own life. Verse 15, he says, For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not... For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want 
but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. This battle between right and wrong, good and evil, between the spirit and the flesh, playing out in his own life. Verse 22, for I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members, in my flesh, another war, another law, waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members, that dwells in my flesh. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thankfully, Paul doesn't leave this question unanswered. He goes on, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. There is somebody who can deliver me from this body of death, who can allow me to obtain victory in this raging battle between the spirit and the flesh in my life and in the life of every believer who is in the pursuit of godliness. So then, I myself serve the law with my mind, but with my flesh, I serve the law of sin. Just a personalized example of what he's talking about here in Galatians 5, the end of Galatians 5. Dr. Thomas Schreiner, a professor up at Southern Seminary, he says this, and uh, a little bit confusing. It was confusing to me when I first read it, but man, when I understood what he was talking about and kind of wrapped my mind around it, it became really helpful in understanding what Paul was talking about here. He says this, he says, The spirit and the flesh resist each other, So that the desires of the flesh will not become a reality. And so that the desires of the spirit will not be realized. Let's work through that real quick. Because I found it to be really helpful. And I hope it's helpful for you as well. He says, the spirit and the flesh are resisting each other. And the reason that the spirit resists the flesh is so that these desires of the flesh will not become a reality. Meaning that all of us go through temptations. All of us have Thoughts arise in our minds that are not of the spirit, that are of the flesh. And he's saying the role of the spirit is to resist those thoughts so that hopefully those thoughts are just fleeting thoughts. They come into the mind and go right back out, and we don't dwell on them. We don't allow them to take root within our minds and within our lives and wreak havoc in our lives. That is the purpose of what the spirit is doing. He's resisting these works of the flesh so they don't become a reality within our lives. So the second part, he says... And uh, so the spirit is resisting the flesh so that they don't become reality. And the flesh is resisting the spirit so that the desires of the spirit will not be realized. What does he mean by that? What he means by that is when we realize the life that is available to us in the spirit, we'll realize that there is no comparison between a life in the spirit in a life in the flesh. These are worlds apart. When you experience true joy and love and, and peace and satisfaction, these fruit of the Spirit, when you tap into that life, that is where you were meant to live. That is what you were made for. This is where life and life abundant happens. And when you experience that, when you come to realize that, the desire of the flesh don't stand a chance. They're worlds apart. Life in the spirit is way, way better than life in the flesh. It reminds me of a C.S. Lewis quote. And this is, a, again, a paraphrase of C.S. Lewis. He says, We are far too easily satisfied with making mud pies in a slum because we cannot imagine what is meant by a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily satisfied. You know, some of us are probably in the midst of planning a vacation right now, or you have recently come back from a vacation. I would be willing to bet, willing to wager, that none of you are planning on, hey, let's, uh, let's take the family to, to India, and uh, let's, go, let's go to the slums, and let's, let's dress in raggedy clothes, and let's, uh, let's sit in the muck and the uh, sewage waters there that are infested by feces and just all kinds of nastiness. And for our vacation, let's get the kids and, and take them. Let's, let's sit down and let's, let's form mud pies. Wouldn't that be a wonderful vacation? 
I bet none of you have ever planned that or are not currently planning that. On the, the flip side of that, um, a vacation at the holiday at the sea sounds a lot better. How many of you would like to do a vacation at the holiday at the sea? Raise of hands. Now, I know some of you are haters out there. You probably don't like the water, don't like the, the animals and whatnot in the water. I get you. But for the rest of us normal people, a vacation <laughs> at the holiday at the sea would be a, a delight, especially compared to that of the slums. And this is exactly what C.S. Lewis is talking about. This is exactly what Paul is talking about. Life in the spirit doesn't even compare to the works of the flesh. The works of the flesh are like a... Uh, like sitting in the slums making mud pies, whereas life in the spirit is like a, a, a holiday at the sea. When we get down to these works of the flesh, in, starting in verse 19, we see that they're broken up into four different categories here. Um, the term works of the flesh, that means, it means actions flowing out of fallen human nature and its desires. And these are things that we normally gravitate towards apart from opposition of the Holy Spirit. So if you don't have the Holy Spirit intervening in your life, then these are what we naturally are inclined to do, these works of the flesh. And they're divided up into four different categories. I'll work through these fairly quickly. The first three items refer to sexual sins. So sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality. The second category that we see, the fourth and fifth works of the flesh, they focus on failure to honor and worship God. Namely, idolatry and sorcery. The third, which is actually the largest section, this is the sixth through the thirteenth works of the flesh. These concentrate on social sins, social sins that disrupt community life. Namely, these are enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy. Paul spends a lot of time talking about how the works of the flesh cause divisions amongst us. And the fourth, the last, category are these are two works of the flesh that relate to what we typically think of as the party life drunkenness orgies it's important to note that this is not an exhaustive list of sins it's not like we can check these things off and be like well i didn't get drunk today i'm living according to the spirit i'm becoming more godly no that's not what paul is trying to communicate by listing these works of the flesh and he communicates that to us uh, by saying, and, and things like these, indicating that, man, there are multiple more sins that portray works of the flesh. These are just a small list, small categorization of the different works of the flesh that we can engage in. But the good news is, Paul doesn't end there. This is not all negative. There is a better way to live, a life of freedom, a life in the Spirit. As Pastor Allen mentioned last week when talking about our freedom in Christ, he said, Christian freedom is not freedom to sin, but a freedom from sin. Anyone who has been involved in life transformation knows that in order to effectively eliminate one behavior, one bad behavior, it has to be replaced with a more productive behavior. I mean, we, we learn this in basic sociology courses when we're trying to rehabilitate a, a felon or somebody that's been released from prison, um, we found through studies that it's not really helpful to tell them to go out and stop doing drugs or stop selling drugs. No, they need to replace that negative behavior with a more productive, positive behavior in society. There's a much better rehabilitation rate when we do that. So basic sociology courses teach us that. And Paul is kind of mimicking the same thing here, that you can't just not do the works of the flesh. No, you need to replace the works of the flesh with the fruit of the Spirit. Um, verse 24, Paul, uh, Paul previously mentioned in Galatians 2.20, uh, we looked at that a few weeks ago, uh, I have been crucified with Christ, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. We saw in that verse, Galatians 2.20, that we are to crucify our fleshly desires to Christ. And we see that same thing kind of mimicked here in verse 24. Um, verse 24, And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. He's connecting back to what he talked about in Galatians 2.20. And he doesn't just talk about it here in the book of Galatians. He also talks about it in pretty much all of his books. One of my favorites is Romans, Romans 8.13. He says, 
For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Again, talking about replacing these works of the flesh with life in the Spirit. I love this quote by John Owen. He said this, Be killing sin, or it will be killing you. You have to be actively battling against these works of the flesh through a disciplined lifestyle that puts you in a place where you can be passively led by the Spirit and in a way that is productive, that a way that promotes godliness within your life. Thinking back to verse 21, I'll jump back there real quick. Paul ultimately ends this list of fleshly works with the ultimate consequence that we will face, not being in the kingdom of God. And this is what Paul is talking about here in verse 21. Here, I'll I'll read it again. Into verse 21, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And this is someone whose life is characterized by these works of the flesh. If your life is dominated by this list of works of the flesh that he he just went through, um, then this has eternal consequences. It reminds me of the quote from the gladiator scene, going back to that, um, possibly the, the most famous quote from that movie. Uh, if you are familiar with the battle scene, they split into two different units. You got the infantry that is attacking the Germanic uh, tribe from the front side, um, and they advance and attack them and meet them kind of in the middle of the battlefield. But then the main character of the movie, uh, Maximus, he rides his horse back and meets uh, a group of cavalry units, and they kind of work their way through the woods and attack from the rear side. Well, while he's meeting with these cavalry units, he kind of gives them a sort of pep talk. And in that pep talk, he says this phrase. He says, what we do in this life echoes in eternity. What we do in this life echoes in eternity. I think that's exactly what Paul is, is communicating here to us as well. That, man, if you live a life that is dominated by the flesh and are not living life according to the Spirit, that has eternal weight, eternal consequence, eternal ramifications to it. What you do in this life echoes throughout eternity. So this brings us to our last and final point, that living in the Spirit, we live in the Spirit by keeping in step with the Spirit. So I've argued throughout this time that um, we see in verse 25, it says, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Here's the third and fourth use that Paul uses all in one verse of how we interact with the Spirit. And my argument has been that um, he is, the whole point of this is how we live by the Spirit. And so he gives us three different ways in which we can live by the Spirit. The first one is by walking by the Spirit through a disciplined lifestyle. The second one is being led by the Spirit passively as we put ourselves into a place where the Spirit can, can lead us into godliness. And here comes the third one. Let us also keep in step with the Spirit. This is the third way in which we live by the Spirit. So, how do we live? How do we keep in step with the Spirit? Well, I mentioned that um, thinking of the, the gladiator opening battle scene. They split into two different units. The main character is leading his cavalry unit into Uh, attack the the German barbarians from the rear and kind of trap them in the middle. And as he's leading this charge, he repeats one command, one instruction over and over again. I think he repeats it three different times in the midst of that charge. Anybody know what it is? Hold the line. Hold the line. So he's leading his cavalry units into battle, and he's instructing them, commanding them at the top of his lungs, hold the line means stay in step with one another. Don't approach this battle individualistically. I want you to follow my lead as your commander in chief, and I want you to stay in line with your brothers in arms and attack them collectively, attack them together. Hold the line. Don't get out of line with one another. And I think that's a beautiful illustration of what Paul's talking about here as well, that let us keep in step with the Spirit. The Spirit is our commander in chief. And so as the Spirit leads us, we're supposed to keep in step with him and follow his his command and his instruction, his leading into the battle against our flesh. 
And we're supposed to do that along with our brothers and sisters in Christ, arm in arm with them as we go into battle and defeat the works of the flesh in our life, allowing our brothers and sisters to encourage us, to rebuke us when necessary, to help point out blind spots in our lives that we're unaware of that are keeping us from becoming godly. Note that Paul reflects back to our horizontal relationships, reminding us that if we are truly living in in accord with the Spirit, then we will also be in unity with our brothers and sisters around us. That's exactly how he ends this passage. Verse 26 says, Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. He's talking about our horizontal relationships there and how we're supposed to keep in step with the Spirit as he leads us, but also simultaneously keep in step with our brothers and sisters in Christ as we all pursue godliness collectively, as we all experience victory over these works of the flesh together as a unified body of Christ. So as we conclude here, we've seen that the flesh and the spirit are battling against each other. These are opposed to one another. And in order to triumph, we are to actively put ourselves into a passive subjection to the spirit's leading within our lives. And this is largely done through the spiritual disciplines. So the question I want to leave us with is, are you experiencing victory in this battle against the flesh? If you take an honest evaluation of yourself as we look at these, these works of the flesh here, is there one or, or maybe a couple of them? that, Man, if you were honest with yourselves, you'd say, gosh, I'm, I'm experiencing more defeat than I am victory with this specific work of the flesh. And I don't say this to shame you. No, I say this to ask you, how can we help you? That is the purpose of this church. That is the heart behind the staff, the pastoral staff of this church, is we want to come alongside you and help you experience victory against the flesh. Why? Because we are in the exact same battle that you are. We are daily battling against a flesh just like you are. And we need brothers and sisters around us to help us obtain victory just as much as you do. And so what can we do to help you experience victory in this ongoing battle against the flesh, in this ongoing battle for godliness? I want to give us two reminders from the illustration of the battle at the beginning of the the Gladiator movie. You know, we know the end result of this battle scene. The Roman army wins decisively, wins fairly easily. Um, But even even if the Roman army had lost that specific battle, what would have happened? Rome would have just sent more troops and squashed the Germanic tribe. Like, there was no chance at all of the Germanic tribe experiencing victory. And the exact same thing is true in our lives. Even if you experience momentary defeat in this specific battle against the flesh in your life, you can take heart knowing that our commander-in-chief, he is victorious, and there is nothing that can stand against him. You, if your life is hid within Christ, you know that you are victorious. At the end of the day, no matter if you've experienced defeat in this battle against sin, against this battle against the flesh, time and time again, you know that, man, at the end of the day, my life is hid in Christ, and there is nothing that can stand against me. That is the power of Christ inside of us. And so that's the first reminder that I I hope is really encouraging to you. The second one is this. We know that they were victorious in that battle. Why? They were victorious because they disciplined themselves through strict training to allow themselves to freely follow their commander and keep in step with the instructions that they were given. This is how we triumph. This is how we become victorious over these works of the flesh, is by strict discipline and training through toil and strife that puts us into a passive position where the Spirit can intervene in our lives and we can consent to the journey that the Spirit's wanting to lead us on and we can stay in step with Him as we experience victory time and time and time again over these works of the flesh. I want to invite the the worship team to come up on stage as we go into a time of prayer. When I ask you to stand, I want to ask you to